So, our next speaker is Mark Lechtig, and he's going to talk about Silly Vaccine, North Korea's weapon of mass detection. Mark is the malware research team leader at Checkpoint, and he deals with reverse engineering and malware analysis, both at, as occupation and as a hobby. So, a huge round of applause to Mark, and we're starting the talk. Let's begin with a short video. Uh, her name is Ri Chan Hee, uh, a good friend of mine, North Korea's main news presenter, um, and she just turned 75 years old this July. Let's give her a warm round of applause for her passionate introduction to Silly Vaccine. <laughs> of course, I'm lying. She's not my friend, uh, nor did she even speak about Silly Vaccine in this video, but still. Kudos to her for uh, grabbing your attention. And again, uh, hello. Thank you for joining me for this talk um, titled Silly Vaccine, North Korea's Weapon of Mass Detection. Uh, before um, I actually uh, tell you about uh, the research story here, um, I would like to introduce you to the two notorious dissidents who are behind this infamous research. You see them right here on the screen. One of them actually happens to be me. Uh, my name is Mark Leftik. Um, as previously mentioned, I'm the malware uh, research team leader and checkpoint. And my partner in crime for uh, this research uh, is named uh, Michael Cagilotti. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today uh, because he's uh, in a vacation in Hawaii, probably drinking some smoothie from a coconut. So I thought this would be a better picture. <laughs> Um, to Michael, have a lot of fun in your travel, come home safely, and beware of uh, Koreans who stare at you suspiciously. Um, now, um, we both work at Checkpoint, as mentioned, and without further ado, uh, let me give you a little bit of a background for this research. Um, so, this whole uh, research actually began uh, at one uh, point this year, around uh, March, when I was uh, looking for something to read in Twitter, and then I stumbled upon uh, this article you see right here, titled Inside uh, North Korea's Hacker Army uh, by Bloomberg. And uh, it's actually a pretty interesting piece. I recommend you to uh, read it. Um, it uh, um, discusses uh, a particular uh, a North Korean defector uh, who was drafted to work uh, for a government agency in North Korea and ended up raising money for the regime through hacking. And an interesting uh, thing I noted uh, throughout um, this uh, publication is that the author tried to portray some kind of a narrative of a North Korean uh, state-sponsored uh, cyber operations. And in particular, in one paragraph, uh, he gives um, a representation of what seems to be uh, the North Korean government's official comment to uh, various hacking allegations uh, made against uh, North Korea by the West. 
And here's a quote. So formally, North Korea denies engaging in hacking and describes accusations to that effect as enemy propaganda. It says its overseas computer efforts are directed at promoting its antivirus software in the global market. The country has for more than a decade been working on such programs, including one called Silly Vaccine. Now, looking at this, you're probably asking yourselves, what the hell is Silly Vaccine? Well, as you may understand by now, Silly Vaccine is an antivirus that is developed and used exclusively in North Korea. So this is basically a North Korean antivirus, or how I like to call it, the Kim Jong-un T-virus. <laughs> now, obviously, this is a very uh, rare product. Uh, you can't find it on the internet. You cannot download it anywhere. Uh, it basically resides only inside the DPRK. As far as we could tell in this research, it's actively developed since 2003. And the version that I'm going to focus on here today is version 4.0, which was released in 2013. Uh, just uh, um, as a caveat, we are also we were also in possession of another version from 2005, uh, which was one of the early versions of Sealy vaccine, and I will mention it a little bit later uh, throughout this talk. Now, if you know anything about North Korea, then one thing uh, you should note is that there's actually no internet inside North Korea, right? Instead, what they have is what's uh, called an intranet, which is this highly uh, restricted, um, um, glorified local area network. And having that in mind, um, you must be thinking, why the hell would North Korea use an antivirus in the first place? Well, there are a few interesting explanations for that. One. The, the more exotic one is to actually protect against threats that might uh, reside within media that is smuggled to the country. And for this matter, uh, as an example, it turns out that there's actually a phenomenon of USB sticks uh, with Western media that somehow uh, magically find their way inside North Korea. And uh, then they get sold uh, in uh, the country's black market uh, to citizens. And I know it sounds totally fucked up, but remember, it's North Korea. And to convince you a little bit better, you're invited to go uh, to this website called Flash Drives for Freedom, which is uh, actually uh, a crowdsource funding project for USB sticks that get written with uh, content from uh, the West and smuggled uh, into North Korea. Uh, so just a fun fact, um, if uh, you have any kind of problems with your local IRS, don't worry, the smuggled USB stick is 100% uh, tax refundable. As for the content inside of it, well, it contains um, just all kinds of information, uh, entertainment content from the West, like uh, Wikipedia articles and uh, South Korean uh, soap operas, uh, which somehow managed to uh, threaten uh, the North Korean regime. But anyways, there's also another explanation for the existence of this antivirus. And this is the fact uh, that um, actually stated by North Korea itself is to raise uh, money for the regime by selling this product uh, in the worldwide market. As a matter of fact, to corroborate this, uh, we can refer to the 2005 version uh, of Sealy vaccine that I mentioned previously, which you can see here on the screen was written both in Korean and English, which might hint at the fact that whoever wrote uh, this version tried to make it more appealing for uh, English speaking users as well as uh, Korean ones. Now, you also must be asking yourselves, how the hell did we get our hands on this software in the first place? Well, uh, the answer to this uh, lies uh, in the Bloomberg article I mentioned earlier. It linked uh, to a blog post by this guy named Martin Williams. Uh, Martin Williams is um, uh, a journalist who, who covers various kinds of news items related to North Korea. And he actually got uh, this um, particular software through, I would say, a slightly suspicious email from a guy uh, calling himself Kang Yong Hak, a security engineer from Japan, uh, who wanted to uh, give it to him as a journalistic lead. Um, and remember this email, we will talk about it a little bit later. 
Uh, now, of course, Martin was kind enough to share the software with us, uh, and um, it's the place to thank him uh, for making this whole research possible. Now, what did we want to find out in this research? So first of all, we wanted to understand the technical structure of the software. How is it built? Through which we hope to get somewhat of an anthropological view on some of the practices employed uh, by the North Korean uh, engineers, meaning how uh, engineers with restricted resources tackle a big project like building an antivirus from scratch. Also, we wanted to um, see uh, if we can find any kind of uh, abnormal behavior inside this uh, uh, antivirus, um, some things that could have been left uh, in place uh, and exposed some hidden agenda of the developers. And in particular, uh, we tried to locate any potential backdoor that could have been deliberately put in place uh, as means of surveillance uh, against the citizens. So, with that in mind, uh, let's uh, uh, take a, a short um, overview of uh, the antivirus's architecture. And for this matter, let's start with the uh, software libraries that comprise it, the first of which is called SV Shell. This is just a basic shell extension that um, uh, introduces this entry in the context uh, menu, uh, which you can see if you uh, uh, click the right uh, mouse button. And this is basically uh, meant to uh, just um, do a manual scan on a file using Silly vaccine. And you know what? Let's just test this feature and see if it works. So here we have a malware, we right click, we press on this feature, and nothing happens. <laughs> Which is really uh, just some kind of a bug that we see right from the very beginning of uh, testing this antivirus. Spoiler, there are more, um, but never mind. Let's move on. The next component we see here is one called svkernel.dll. Now this is in fact the file scanning engine of this antivirus. And this is really the core component that contains the logic that implements a virus scan of files. This DLL uh, exposes uh, roughly 20 export functions uh, with the names svfunk001 through svfunk020, a very ambiguous uh, naming convention. And they are, of course, used in conjunction with patterns or signatures, uh, which is the content that allows the software to decide if a given file is malicious or not. Um, then we have another group of components, which is pretty self-explanatory. These are uh, the GUI components, uh, the first of which is um, this tray menu you, see, you can see on the right um, uh, corner of the screen. And this uh, little menu allows you to execute any other um, GUI uh, menus in this uh, antivirus. For instance, uh, you can uh, see the following menu. Um, where you can do a full scan on the file system. Um, you can uh, play around with some of the configurations of this uh, antivirus. Um, it's also possible to do some uh, whitelisting and blacklisting actions. And basically, this is a GUI one-stop shop for all of these of this uh, antivirus's features. Uh, another, uh, oh, before uh, talking about the other components, svmain actually communicates with a driver called svhook.sys. Um, this is a driver that is meant to convey some information uh, to svmain uh, from the kernel space. We will discuss this driver a little bit later. Then we have uh, the update mechanism uh, of, the of the antivirus, which will basically download any kind of update binaries uh, and components or update signatures, and it will verify them with an external uh, uh, component called svdfupd.exe. And of course, as I mentioned, everything here uh, resides inside uh, North Korea's intranet, so uh, this update client will uh, communicate uh, with a server inside North Korea, um, and it will do so using a custom update protocol which works on top of uh, uh, the HTTP protocol. And here you can see some of the messages exchanged between this uh, update client and server. And one thing I would like you to notice is the vast amount of information conveyed uh, through this uh, update protocol. Uh, you can see fields like a serial number, some kind of an interface ID, an IP, which is, for the most part, kind of suspicious. Uh, I mean, why the hell do they need all of this, this information just uh, for an update mechanism? 
but uh, since we don't have any access to the server or any kind of way to understand um, how the user uh, communicates with it, um, we can't really tell why this information is collected. So we'll just uh, leave this fact as is. Another interesting thing is that the whole uh, HTTP protocol was manually implemented uh, by the developers. And along the way, they did some um, interesting mistakes. For instance, the content length field of the HTTP header is written with an underscore here, which is kind of a mistake. Uh, it's not the way it is intended to be used. Also, um, the authors wanted to convey uh, the client's, the update client's identity to the server, and they did so uh, with the user agent, which is a pretty um, typical way of, of doing this. But instead of only using the user agent, they added another field called user dealer, which I have no idea what kind of dealer they <laughs> had in mind. But obviously, this has nothing to do with the HTTP protocol. And speaking of dealers, there is yet another component here called svdealer.exe, which is actually the real-time scanning component of this antivirus, um, which you can enable through the tray menu as well. And this particular component will use another driver called svfilter.sys, uh, which is a file system filter driver meant to intercept all kinds of um, um, access to the uh, file system and um, issue the underlying file to a scan uh, prior to actually doing any kind of action on it. And again, we'll uh, discuss uh, this particular driver uh, later on. Um, at this point, I should mention that the two components here that actually uh, do any kind of scanning tests are svdealer and svmain that you see here on the screen. Obviously, they would have to use the um, file scanning engine for this purpose and also a bunch of signatures which are represented through a series of files uh, called the pattern files. Um, Another thing here that we have as a driver that I'm not going to talk about at all, this is uh, a, a driver called ststdi2.sys. This is basically a TDI network filter driver. If you don't have any idea what I just said, this is perfectly fine because this driver does absolutely nothing. It just resides inside this antivirus and uh, collects all kinds of information about TCP connections. And it should be queried theoretically by other components, but no one ever queries it, so it seems like it's just some kind of a residue from previous versions of Silly Vaccine. So we'll just leave it be, I guess. And another interesting point here is that a lot of these components you see here were protected with a legitimate um, um, protector, a commercial protector called Themida, which uh, if you heard of it, you probably know it's a pain in the ass to reverse engineer. Luckily for us, um, Whoever used this protector did not enable a lot of uh, its features, and we could unpack it with moderate efforts. Um, this is the full architecture of this uh, antivirus. I'm not going to go any further in it. Uh, you can read about it uh, in our uh, publication, full publication about this uh, software. Um, actually, I want to focus in all of this uh, complicated scheme on one particular component, which I already discussed, this is svkernel.dll. I remind you, this is the file scanning engine of the antivirus. This is really the heart and soul of this whole software. And this is why we're going to talk about it next. And I would like to begin this discussion about this component with uh, what every good reverse engineer looks at. And these are strings, of course. And the first thing we did was to open this file and look at its strings. And like uh, every uh, professional reverse engineer, uh, we looked them up in Google. And um, here's, ladies and gentlemen, where it actually gets interesting. Because it turns out that if we look at it in Google, we come to another file called vsapi32.dll. Now, what is vsapi32.dll? As it turns out, this is yet another file scanning engine. Actually, it's a file scanning engine belonging to a big uh, corporate in the security field, and that is Trend Micro, which we thought was kind of surprising. And looking at this, we thought, does it mean that this DLL is in some way incorporated inside Sealy Vaccine? 
Did they use any kind of interesting way of incorporating its functionality inside uh, their engine? Well, let's find out. So here on the screen, you can see uh, what's called a binary uh, diff. This is a, a binary comparison between uh, those two engines. On the left side, you can see the Trend Micro engine, and on the right side, you can see the Silly Vaccine engine. And actually, you can notice a few things here. For one, there's a 100% match between more than a thousand functions of those uh, two engines. A thousand functions like a quarter of uh, Silly Vaccine's uh, engine code. Uh, and then you can see also that there's a 100% match on some of the export functions. Um, in fact, if you look at all of the first 18 export functions in Silly Vaccine, you realize they somehow map to functions of Trend Micro. Uh, and as an example, let's just take uh, three of these functions and look at their call flow graphs uh, in IDA, and we can see that they're uh, pretty similar for the most part. But I would say it's more interesting to note the small nuances or the small differences between uh, those uh, particular functions. And as an example, let's take this pair of functions, vsinit and svfunc005. And one interesting thing we noted at the very beginning is that while Trend Micro's uh, engine uses mostly libc functions like memset, for instance, the uh, equivalent in uh, Silly Vaccine would at some points inline those functions. It would use function inlining uh, to convey the same function. And that essentially hints at the fact that uh, the developer of Silly Vaccine could have recompiled uh, this particular Trend Micro uh, code with some kind of a compiler optimization that was uh, not applied on the original engine. You can see another example for this right here uh, with the mem copy and qmem copy, the, its uh, inline equivalent. And let's look uh, at another pair uh, for this matter. So we have uh, vs get vsc info and svfunc004. Uh, once again, function inlining. But uh, another artifact that was left here um, is, are these numbers you see right here. So uh, it turns out that. Um, this particular field that uh, is populated uh, in this struct you see here is actually the engine version uh, of uh, this antivirus. And um, it turns out that the engine version used inside Silly Vaccine is 8.910, which is an engine used by Trend or released by Trend Micro back in 2008. Now recall that this software is from 2013. So basically, um, whoever wrote this uh, was using a five-year-old engine inside uh, his code. And finally, let's look at uh, another pair, uh, VSQuit and svfunc006. Um, once again, you can see a call to a proprietary uh, CD vaccine function inside what used to be a trend micro function. Uh, this is just some kind of a cleanup function uh, for a driver called SVIO, which has nothing to do with trend micro. And this, again, um, strengthens uh, this uh, kind of speculation that um, uh, when uh, compiling a CD vaccine, uh, there was some kind of a use of a proprietary resource um, that belongs to Trend Micro. Well, uh, I would like to mention at this point that um, this was not uh, the only instance of uh, Trend Micro engine uh, we found uh, in CD vaccine. So in the 2005 version, which I uh, I mentioned earlier, we actually found a trace uh, of another um, um, component by Trend Micro, which is called tmfilter.sys. Uh, this is actually a kernel mode uh, equivalent of uh, this engine called VSAPI32. And this really shows that this whole sort of copyright infringement was not a one-time thing. It has been possibly going on for uh, quite a few years. Now, we reached out to Trend Micro to get the response, and basically, uh, just to sum this up, uh, Trend Micro says that, uh, yes, Silly uh, Vaccine uh, used a 10-plus-year-old uh, 10 version uh, of their engine in uh, their code. Uh, they said, like, what the fuck, we did not do any business with North Korea. Um, also, um, they're saying we have no idea how they got our engine, uh, but they do hint at the fact that uh, they worked uh, with uh, some vendors as OEM back at that time, and maybe it's possible that one of these OEMs uh, leaked their code or whatnot, so who knows. Um, 
So other than, you know, looking at this, other than saying that this is a very kind of secretive uh, antivirus that's developed uh, inside North Korea, um, we couldn't help but notice that there are quite a lot of mechanisms used by the authors to conceal the fact that they're using a third-party product. And again, uh, I remind you, we just realized that CD vaccine is essentially using a trained microengine, and we thought if they're using the same engine, does it mean that they're actually using the same signatures as well? So if we compare this on the surface, then it seems that no, uh, because Sealy vaccine has multiple uh, of pattern files, while Trend Micro has one single uh, large file. And also there seems to be no kind of uh, um, similarity between, between them on the binary level. But if we look a little bit deeper, uh, then we can find the place in the code where those particular pattern files are being loaded. This, is, uh, this happens in svkernel uh, DLL, in a particular function called svfunc19. Uh, and what happens there is that um, the name of the particular uh, uh, pattern file, of one of the pattern files, uh, is uh, being uh, um, uh, calculated or generated. Then a handle to this file uh, is obtained the contents of the file are being read, then this particular file is being decrypted. The decrypted chunk is appended to some buffer in memory. The ID of this chunk uh, is incremented and this whole process repeats. So essentially what this function does is to load the pattern files one by one, decrypt them and append them all together. Now before I talk a little more about the encryption here, let's talk a little bit about the encryption key because there's something interesting here. So this is the encryption key used there, a seemingly random English string. We thought, does it mean anything in Korean? It doesn't mean anything in any language, actually. Um, but an interesting thing happens when we take this particular string to a Korean English keyboard. And um, we try to type it while accidentally uh, forgetting to switch to English. So we get this Korean string. And if we translate this Korean string to English, turns out that it literally means pattern encryption. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, okay, so we, we decided to uh, look a little bit deeper now Regarding the encryption itself, we saw a lot of encryption mechanics inside. Some have some cryptographic artifacts that resemble the SHA-1 algorithm, for instance, and all kinds of other stuff. We basically didn't really bother understanding this whole mechanism very deeply because we were interested in the decrypted pattern files, which we could simply dump from memory, and that's what we did. And after dumping this from memory, uh, and comparing the two signature files uh, one, uh, one to another, we can actually see a similarity uh, in the header. And if we scroll a little bit down, we can also see that there's uh, quite much of a similarity in strings. Actually, there's more than 90% uh, match uh, amongst the strings in those two files. And the, ver the difference is uh, probably due to uh, the version of those pattern files. Now, that's not the end. We decided to test this thing so uh, we scanned a bunch of files uh, with uh, Sealy vaccine. They were all detected. We scanned them also with Trend Micro. They were also all detected, but there's something interesting here. Although uh, they're using uh, the same signatures and same strings, the detection names are totally different. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, suspicious. So it turns out there's a reason for this. And the reason is that Sealy vaccine actually renames the signature names before displaying them to the user. And here is how this works. So basically, Silly Vaccine will take a Trend Micro uh, signature name for this purpose, uh, torch underscore steel dash one. It would then replace, it would then uh, strip it off uh, uh, the underscores and dashes, and then replace uh, the prefix with um, some kind uh, of uh, word based on a, a string based on a predefined dictionary. It will also replace the suffix from a letter, uh, from a number to a letter. It will modify the casing, append everything together with dots, and this is how you get a silly vaccine signature. 
So looking at all of this, uh, it's interesting to note that the authors are probably trying to hide something. So just to summarize all of these hiding mechanisms, let's just uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, take a look at what we've already seen. So basically all of the files or most of the files in this uh, um, software are protected with the media, commercial protector, uh, which means that the binary files uh, does not have any kind of string artifacts uh, that allow uh, a researcher to understand what he's looking at. Also, the pattern files are encrypted, so we don't have any string artifacts there. Uh, you can understand uh, from those signature files what you're looking at. And finally, uh, the, uh, um, the malware signatures are renamed in real time, so it means that even in real time you cannot tell uh, what was uh, the original uh, signature or where it came from. Um, so, essentially, the user and a researcher won't have any way of knowing that this product is using the engine of Trend Micro, which is a little puzzling. So, moving on, let's talk about more of the fishy things that go inside of this product. Namely, while analyzing it, we've seen a lot of the following uh, instances of this string, mal.newcrypt.f, and we realized that um, uh, based on its format, it's probably some kind of um, um, a signature name. So we decided to uh, uh, understand what it was. We ran our algorithm in reverse, and we get this uh, following um, uh, detection name, uh, mal underscore newcrypt dash five. But what's the deal with this signature? Why does it even stand out from the other ones? Well, here are two instances where uh, this particular signature name is used. Um, so here you can see actually that what happens with this signature is that a file is being scanned uh, to, to detect if it's malicious or not. Then, if it was found to be malicious, then its detection name is compared against this string. And if that's the case, then Sealy Vaccine will simply ignore this file, which is suspicious. <laughs> now, of course, we wanted to test this thing, so uh, we ran um, six files uh, that were supposed to be detected uh, with uh, this particular detection name in uh, Trend Micro. They were all detected. Then we decided to run them in Sealy Vaccine, and nothing was detected. And actually, this is quite surprising because we did a little bit of QA on this, and it turns out that for the most part, it's OK. But then in one instance, they made a typo, and they whitelisted something called malnurcrypt.f which has no equivalent in uh, Trend Micro's engine, which begs the question, what the fuck is NewCrypt? Um, and according to Trend Micro's encyclopedia, which is a thing, apparently, mal uh, underscore NewCrypt dash five is described as some kind of a signature related to uh, some old malware named NewWar, Tibbs, Zilat. We checked all of them. They have no relation whatsoever to North Korea. But a deeper inspection of this uh, signature name reveals that actually the smell prefix you see right here uh, means that this is a generic detection that flags uh, files based on some heuristic, which in essence might detect a whole spectrum of files. So unfortunately, based on only on this information, we cannot know what malware was exactly detected here or really if it was uh, malware at all. But we can still speculate on why this whitelisting was done. And for one, uh, the most obvious speculation would be that there is some kind of an existing North Korean tool installed on uh, citizens' computers, and the authors didn't want to trigger an alert about it being malicious. It's also possible that the authors wanted uh, some option to develop such a tool in the future, and um, they uh, inserted this uh, signature in order to conceal this uh, future component with this particular whitelisting mechanism. It's also possible that uh, since uh, the authors used um, a third-party engine, the Trend Micro engine, uh, that this signature mistakenly detected one of uh, um, uh, CV Vaccine's original components as malware, which they clearly wanted to avoid. And of course, it's also possible that this whole thing is some kind of an uh, idiotic uh, false positive management fix, but uh, I would say this is unlikely. All right, um, let's move on and talk about the kernel side of Sealy Vaccine. And remember, Sealy Vaccine has three uh, kernel mode drivers, um, but actually only two of them are uh, utilized, svfielder and svhook.sys, so let's focus on them. 
And we started snooping around uh, and looking at these drivers. And uh, the first thing we noted is uh, some fishy stuff, like uh, the fact that its entry point resides in the relog section, and uh, that it's supposedly uh, packed with some kind of a packer called BobCrypt, uh, which we never heard of. And we looked around BobCrypt. Turned out this is an old uh, Russian uh, PE packer uh, that supposedly contains some common uh, protection features such as anti-debug measures and uh, polymorphic code. Now, this is not really good news when dealing with the kernel driver because who wants to debug polymorphic code in the kernel? So we thought, wait a second, before we dive in and do all of these stuff, maybe we can actually find some kind of an answer by looking at this uh, file again from the outside. And turns out that our answer was right there, and our answer is 42. <laughs> actually, it's hex 42. So evidently, this whole crazy protection scheme here is that the text section that contains the actual driver is sort with a single byte of the value 42 hex. Um, so with this uh, insane protection mechanism, uh, which we were able to bypass, uh, we were able to look at the uh, drivers themselves. And the first one of them, svfilter.sys, I remind you, this is a file system filter driver. This is loaded and utilized by svdealer. This is the real-time scanning component, and it has two main functionalities. One is to actually scan files upon access, so it would intercept any kind of uh, activity uh, with the file system, and it would take the underlying fi uh, file and would issue it to svdealer to conduct a scan on it. Um, and also, uh, it's actually used to protect the antivirus's binaries themselves uh, to avoid any kind of um, um, malfunction against them by uh, the user. And um, it really took us quite some time to realize that these are the only two things that this driver does, because the code for them is really a mess. And I'm going to save you uh, some time and explain uh, the flow of this driver by simplifying it a little bit. So this is how svfilter.sys uh, works in a nutshell. The first action it does is waste time. <laughs> so it does a lot of redundant checks that seem to have no effect on this code whatsoever. Then it moves on to see if the file scanned here is actually binary uh, related to the antivirus itself. Of course, if it is, then it will deny access to it. Then it moves to the very important um, action of wasting a lot more time <laughs> by doing what seems to be pretty much uh, garbage code. Um, and finally, at some point, it will take the file, it will scan it, and if the file uh, seems to be malicious, then it will deny the access to it. Otherwise, it will allow the access. So this is um, pretty much everything to say about svfilter. There was another driver uh, called svhook.sys, which is uh, utilized by uh, the main uh, GUI component, svmain.exe. Um, you look at this name and you think, yes, it probably hooks stuff. No, it doesn't actually hook anything. Uh, it's actually used uh, to query uh, some kind of process object uh, uh, data from uh, the kernel. And really, it's quite of a confusing uh, um, driver because it seems to have like 13 ioctals, only three are ever used, and it's highly, highly buggy. There's a lot of bugs there. So for instance, um, we seen the following function um, uh, where, uh, um, um, where there's an ioctal issued uh, to um, this driver. Um, and it really seems that those two components, svmain and svhook, were really developed by two different developers. So here we can see that this, um, uh, dri this programmer who wrote this particular uh, uh, ioctal uh, call um, actually uh, used a buffer of size 12. Now you would assume that those two developers have agreed that this should be the input buffer size, right? Well, evidently, the second uh, developer was not really notified about this, and in fact, checks explicitly that the buffer size is 12, and if that's the case, nothing happens. <laughs> Which really uh, is a piece of shit code that does nothing. So, 
while looking at this, we, 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 we try to dig a little bit deeper and understand uh, why those bugs happen, and we think we have uh, an answer. So just strolling around, we see a lot of this. Um, if you look at this, you realize that you're looking at a lot of debug prints uh, used by the author. And you see that one of the uh, parts of the strings referenced here is sub underscore 800 something, uh, which is an IDA auto-generated name. Which to me, ladies and gentlemen, seems like instead of looking at authentic code, we were in fact reverse engineering a reverse engineered driver. So essentially what happened here is that the developer of SVHook uh, took some driver, uh, decompiled it, copied the code, and added uh, a bunch of debug prints in order to try to understand why he was, uh, what he was copying. And it seems he didn't only fail to understand it, but he also forgot to remove this uh, trail of uh, debug prints that demonstrates uh, his elite uh, coding skills. So. We are nearly at the end, and we talked quite uh, a bit about the technical parts here, but to get the full picture, I think it's a good idea to look at the development story uh, behind the software. So in essence, who is behind Silly Vaccine? Well, to tackle this question, uh, we resorted to some uh, version info that can be found inside the antiviruses binaries. And there we found uh, some version manifests that pointed at uh, several companies, the first one of which is called PGI, Pyongyang Guangmyong Information Technology. Uh, it seems to be some kind of a North Korean establishment, a known one, um, that specializes in network security software. But really, the more interesting uh, um, company that we found there was called STS Tech Service, which is really this kind of um, shady company that has no trace of its activity online. We couldn't find any kind of artifact that uh, shows what this company does or uh, um, what is its main uh, um, field of uh, occupation. So we still can answer some uh, uh, questions about STS Tech Service. For instance, we can say that uh, STS Tech Service is highly likely based in uh, the DPRK in North Korea. And that is due to this uh, brochure you see here on the screen, which is taken from a uh, trade fair that took place in Pyongyang back in uh, 2006. And in this particular trade fair, um, uh, this company, STS Tech Service, they participated. We contacted the organizers, uh, and they actually um, confirmed that STS Tech Service did come from the North Korean side. Still, uh, some questions remain. Is that a private company in North Korea? Is that even a thing? Is that a government entity? Is that the same thing in North Korea? We, we don't know. Um, actually, uh, another source uh, told us that this might be, this company might be a subdivision of the KPA, where KPA stands for Korea People's Army, but we have no way of uh, corroborating this. And you remember, Trend Micro stated that their engine will, could have been leaked uh, uh, from a third party. Um, could that third party be this company? Well, we don't know, actually, but what we did see, and which was really uh, interesting, uh, is a particular connection between uh, North Korea and Japan that repeats throughout this whole research. So, for one, we've already seen that SV kernel uh, is basically some kind of um, uh, modified version of Trend Micro's engine. But then we also seen that STS Tech Service at some point cooperated with a company called Silver Star Japan on a particular uh, application. As a matter of fact, it not only uh, um, cooperated with them, but also with another company called Magnolia, which also resides in Japan. Actually, Silver Star and Magnolia reside in the same address in Japan, which is quite interesting. And then, in a particular uh, instance, uh, all of these three companies, uh, Magnolia, Silver Star, and STS Tech Service, cooperated with the KCC, uh, uh, very uh, famous uh, North Korean research establishment, the Korea Computer Center, on another application. And it's important to say that while uh, we can be very easily drawn to some conclusions here and speculate on some very wild scenarios, especially given the fact that North Korea and Japan are not friends, um, we need to remember that this is just a crazy web of connections that we unraveled here. And actually, we cannot say much about this other than pointing out the connections themselves. Still, um, I can say that uh, we did find some uh, traces of maliciousness uh, in this uh, whole uh, um, um, package. And at this point, we thought, 
All right, we are done with the research. Um, could it be that there is uh, no malware or backdoor here? Um, well, turns out that if we look back on this email sent by this um, supposedly uh, Japanese engineer, Kang Yong Hak, uh, and we inspect the installer uh, provided in this particular email, then uh, actually it has no metadata. And that's not surprising because this uh, installer uh, is in fact, or this file is in fact a self-extracting archive which contains the real installer of Sealy Vaccine. But then it also contains another file called svpatch4.0, which, well, okay. But when you look at the metadata, you see it's supposedly related to Microsoft automatic updates, which is again, highly suspicious. <laughs> now, we decided to look deeper in this file, and it turns out that actually this file is a signed binary. And if you look the issuer up in Google, we come to a Kaspersky report about the Dark Hotel APT. Very alarming. Um, and then we decided to dig deeper and analyze this file. So um, we did some analysis. We realized that this is actually the stage one uh, malware uh, from a known uh, campaign called Jakku, uh, uncovered by Forcepoint in 2016. Now, what is Jakku? Uh, Jakku is, uh, it was an ongoing botnet campaign. Uh, it targeted uh, mainly North Korea and Japan. And while it infected a lot of victims, the later stages of the malware, stages two and three, uh, were only used against a select group of indiv individuals with uh, North Korea and Pyongyang being the common theme between them. Now, another interesting connection that was outlined by Forcepoint is between Jakku and Dark Hotel, which is really further evidence to this kind of a, an interesting connection uh, on top of what we saw with the certificate uh, used previously. Now, who could be the target here? It could be the case that every Sealy vaccine installation is bundled with this malware, but we really don't think so. We actually think that the target was uh, Martin Williams, uh, who deals uh, uh, vastly with North Korea, and it is possible that this particular malware was uh, used against him. So, um, this is pretty much the end. I would like to, before I let you go, I would like to summarize everything that we've seen uh, in this talk. And let's uh, look back and uh, see those things. So, for one, we have seen that Sealy Vaccine has been illegally using Trend Micro's engine. And it, is, it was not a one-time thing. It has been done um, um, at least two times and probably over um, um, multiple versions and for several years. Then uh, we've also seen that uh, um, the authors of Sealy Vaccine tried to conceal uh, the fact that they used this engine uh, with some uh, interesting mechanism. Then uh, we've seen that there's an explicit whitelisting of a particular uh, signature and that the installation of Sealy Vaccine comes bundled with the malware called Jakku. Now, well, um, having uh, these understandings, we still have some unanswered questions. For instance, um, we've seen that there are some artifacts that point at the fact that uh, the code of Sealy Vaccine might have been recompiled with some other uh, uh, optimizations that were not in uh, Trend Micro's uh, engine in the first place. So having said that, how did the Sealy Vaccine authors obtain uh, such an access to a proprietary resource? We have no idea. Uh, also, this whitelisted signature, we cannot say uh, what it represents. It's a heuristic signature, so uh, we cannot really tell if it was trying to whitelist a malicious tool or a benign software. It's not very clear. And then uh, also this Jakku malware, since we only have one instance of this particular uh, software from 2013, it's hard to say if it's bundled with all versions or only with this one. And while I can't answer all of these questions uh, concisely. I do want to point out that throughout this research, we've seen a lot of effort uh, done to develop this uh, particular uh, product. And through this effort, we've stumbled upon quite many illegal and shady practices uh, employed by the DPRK to uh, develop their own homebrew software. A software that, remember, maybe sometime, uh, another time, and in a perfect world, could have been totally legitimate. And with that in mind, I would like to thank you for your attention and hope you enjoy your time at CCC.
Thank you, Mark. That was wonderful. We have plenty of time for questions, and we have two microphones. One is in the middle of the room, and one is to the left side of the stage. So please queue up if you want to ask questions. And we already have a question on the microphone one. Do you have any idea why they choose Twent Micro over any other engine? Excuse me, could you repeat the question and raise your hand because I don't see you? Do you have any idea why they choose Twent Micro and not any other engine like an open source engine for example? Do I have any idea of Trend Micro's tools as what? Well? I'm sorry? Do you have any idea why Trend Micro was chosen by them? Ah, why Trend in Micro In comparison to anything yeah. else? So Actually, I have no idea. I really Thank have no idea. Thank you. If you know, then tell me, please. Thank you. Uh, microphone two. So, have you looked at the fact that uh, this uh, antivirus is an XE, so it runs on Windows, but all of North Korea runs Red Star OS, which is a Unix? Well, um, as far as I could tell from uh, people I discussed with who do know a few things about North Korea, um, actually Red Star OS is not the most common operating system there. Uh, in fact, it's barely used because, well, uh, to say it shortly, it's shit. Um, but um, they do use um, what seems to be some kind of Chinese versions of Windows XP and Windows 7. Um, so this is intended to run on these operating systems. Thank you. Another question from Mike Wan. Um, how did you get the, um, the 2005 version of, um, of the antivirus? Come to me later and I'll tell you. <laughs> Mike Wan, please. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to know if you checked that the bundle JQ malware was not uh, part of this whitelist program. Uh. Oh, yes. We checked it. Actually, this was not the whitelisted signature. Um, um, it, it was actually not detected uh, by Silly Vaccine, but it was also not detected by Trend Micro. It was not detected by anyone, actually, so uh, it was not the whitelisted signature. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the amazing talk.